Hello and welcome to this video on the eve of the release of the very first James Webb Space Telescope images. And this is going to be a video to get you all excited for what's coming ahead because the history of this telescope's pretty incredible. Development originally began in 1996. 1996, so that was six years after the launch of the now veteran Hubble Space Telescope. And I mean, this is the year I went to university, and you can see how long ago that was from the grey hairs I now have and that I'm wearing glasses. And when they sat down to go, let's build a new telescope, Born Slippy was ringing around university halls of residence and train spotting posters were on the walls. So this has been a while in development with the plan to launch it in 2007. So how well did that go? Oh, well, let's not dwell on the budget. We kind of have to mention it, but we don't want to dwell on it because the budget was $500 million. And that's a phenomenal amount of money, but it's not even close to the eventual cost after all the overruns. So if we ask how did that go, well, it didn't really go at all because it kind of went through all sorts of delays and various administration changes in the US where the political situation dramatically affects budgets and priorities. You know, the new heads of NASA want to do their own thing. And really, if it weren't for the cost being so high that they had to launch the damn thing, it probably would have been cancelled years ago. And they went through a major, major redesign in 2005, two years before it was supposed to launch according to the original plan. And they hadn't even designed the thing. And the outputs of that 2005 redesign is essentially what we ended up with. And it took quite a while, you know, it was completed in 2016. So again, okay, yeah, that's only 20 years after the initial concept. And 20 years for a grand space observatory, that probably doesn't seem too bad. And after a few cost overruns, that kind of to be expected, but not on this scale, from $500 million to an eventual $10 billion, 20 times the original cost. And these few cost overruns has kind of earned it the reputation of the telescope that ate astronomy, because it's pretty much eaten the astronomy budget of NASA and a lot of the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency astronomy budgets as well. Now, looking at the figures and comparing Hubble to the James Webb Space Telescope, if you work out the build and the launch costs of Hubble and then all of the subsequent servicing and upgrade missions, more money was spent on constructing, launching and then servicing Hubble than has been spent on the James Webb Space Telescope the new, modern, super advanced telescope of today. But that said, Hubble has been with us for 30 years and operating and being upgraded in possibly the most expensive maintenance missions the world has ever seen by launching the fricking space shuttle and seven astronauts five times to service it at a cost of almost a billion dollars a time. And we've yet to get a shred of data from JWST. But it is coming in just a few days of this we are now assured but the hubble space telescope is the most successful telescope that's ever been launched into space and possibly the most successful that's ever been built for space or land because it has the honor of being the science instrument that has spawned the most research papers ever and professional astronomers are queuing up just as much for time on the Hubble Space Telescope as they ever were, despite it being 30 years old. Its science output is unrivaled by any other telescope. And you could probably say that it's the success of Hubble that justified to NASA, ESA, and the Canadian Space Agency the cost of building its successor. So it's really exciting now 
that we're getting so close to the first science observations of this latest generation telescope. But the delays and the cost and everything, I mean, here we are getting towards the middle of 2022, and I'm still here talking about what JWST is, why we need it, and what it's going to do, rather than telling you about how it's operating and what it's discovered. Well, it did launch last December, and it made it to Lagrange Point 2, one and a half million kilometers away from Earth, with a super precise send-off from the Ariane 5 rocket that was so precise that Webb won't have to use up as much of its own fuel staying in its parking orbit. And why is that important? Well, onboard fuel is a limiting factor on the operational lifetime of some of the sensors, those that need to be supercooled. And that precise launch has more than doubled the lifetime of those sensors to more than 10 years. But the key thing to keep in mind is that despite being referred to as the successor to Hubble, JWST is quite different and certainly more powerful in fact, NASA have confirmed that Hubble will continue to operate for as long as it's able, working alongside JWST, as they see different things. So they're complementary. The James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope, and Hubble seems primarily into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, the optical wavelengths of light, like the light we can see with our own eyes, and it flirts a little bit with the infrared part of the spectrum. But broadly, they're the same type of telescope. They're both Cassegrain telescopes. So, you know, that is, light goes in, it hits a primary mirror, which is then directed to a secondary mirror, and the secondary mirror sends the light back down to the instruments. That's why there's a hole in the middle of the Hubble Space Telescope mirror. That's why there's a hole in the middle of this hexagonal mirror that the James Webb Space Telescope's got because that's where all the instruments are hidden, sort of behind the mirror. And the James Webb Space Telescope is enormous. We've done two shows on JWST before this one, and we've not actually mentioned how enormous the thing is. It has a six and a half meter mirror, making it six times the size of Hubble's mirror and a hundred times more powerful. Oh, and the sun shield that was meticulously unfolded automatically in space over a couple of weeks after launch is about the size of a freaking tennis court. It just blows my mind that they have to have over 300 different unfolding mechanisms to unfurl this thing to get it to work because it was like origami to the extreme. No rocket fairing is large enough for James Webb to fit inside so it had to be folded up for launch and that meant folding up the giant mirror. The secondary mirror was folded up. They had to release something like 140 pegs just to get that bloody sun shield to unfold. And there was no one out there to do it. It was all designed and tested on Earth and then essentially sent up on a hope and a prayer that it would work exactly right in space where no one could go out and put it right if something got stuck or didn't latch it into place. One tiny issue, one of hundreds of automatic manoeuvres, not 100% successful, and a $10 billion space mission is over before it even started. It was terrifying getting the updates in January because the failure points in this thing was just such a huge list. It was really scary. And because the universe doesn't like us feeling comfortable, coincidentally, the Lucy space mission to Jupiter's Trojan asteroids had difficulty with unfurling its solar panels after launch that same month. And that wasn't anything near as complex as JWST's manoeuvres. And while JWST had undergone a barrage of testing, it had basically been sitting there, finished and waiting for launch for the last five years. And I know it's not the same thing at all, but all the machinery I know can't move if it's been sitting for more than a year. But it did launch. It successfully got into its parking orbit, it successfully unfurled, and it went through its alignment and calibration tests with no issues in February and March this year. The web team at NASA completed 
the critical stage of alignment called fine phasing, where every optical parameter that has been checked and tested is certified as fully performing. During this phase, the team also found no other issues like contamination or blockages in the telescope. Phew. So we can now say that this spacecraft is getting closer to being an actual observatory and that milestone meant the team is confident that Webb's first of its kind optical system is working as well as possible. And I think after a number of years of nervousness, we can all heave a huge sigh of relief. Thomas Zabukan, NASA's Associate Administrator for their Science Mission Directorate said, more than 20 years ago, the Webb team set out to build the most powerful telescope that anyone has ever put in space and came up with an audacious optical design to meet demanding science goals. Today we can say that design is going to deliver. NASA's Deputy Optical Telescope Element Manager, Ritva Keskikua said, we have finally aligned and focused the telescope on a star and the performance is beating specifications. We're excited about what this means for science because we now know we have built the right telescope. So the team pressed on through the remaining alignment steps and the final science instrument preparations. These steps involved aligning the telescope and bringing the spectrographs and infrared images online. And because we now live in the 21st century, an algorithm actually evaluates the performance of each of these instruments and then calculates the final corrections needed to fully align all the science instruments together. So where are we now? How long until it's actually working and delivering spectacular science, which is what we're all hungry for, right? Well, the NASA team have concluded all the alignment checks and we're right at the end of the science instrument preparations before Webb's first full resolution imagery and science data are released in a few days. If you're watching this later, they'll already be out. And astronomers have already been getting giddy just from the first alignment image because even the image of its reference star in focus shows tons of entire galaxies in the background. In this image, you can see faint edge-on and face-on galaxies that you can zoom in on to reveal spiral arms, flocculent disks, gas swirls, dust lanes, and possible galaxy mergers. And these are just incidental grabs. They're not being intentionally imaged. So the level of detail and insights we're going to get in just a few days is just incredible. Some of the distorted background objects in the image have led many people to ask if James Webb has accidentally captured strange effects like black holes or Einstein rings. These weird visual effects caused by light being bent around massive background objects. And as luck would have it, we have an update on this from a friend of our podcast, Mike Engesser at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is the Science Operations Center for Hubble, the Nancy Grace Roman, and the James Webb Space Telescopes. And Mike told us, on the podcast, you've correctly identified these as imaging artifacts. However, for the interested, I can explain, these are called snowballs. They're a type of artifact similar to cosmic rays. When a normal cosmic ray hits the detector, it affects only the impacted pixels and their immediate neighbors. Snowballs are thought to result from the radioactive decay of some elements in the detector itself. They carry much more energy and the charge gets dispersed over tens to hundreds of pixels instead of just a handful. It was expected that we would see these in the mercury cadmium tellurium detectors. There is some debate about whether they'll be seen in later images depending on whether this was an artifact or not. If not, that'll be really exciting. But from these alignment and calibration images, the great news is that the JWST team at NASA now expects the telescope's optical performance will be able to meet or even exceed the science goals the observatory was built to achieve. And of course, we'll update you with every big discovery it makes because there will be so many. So how good is that? And as this video is launched, 
we know it's already begun science operations. As we speak, it's taking its first showcase show-off images to release to the eagerly awaiting world next week. We've had dozens of people emailing our podcast and suggesting their guesses for what the first exciting image might be. And again, Mike Engesser at the Space Telescope Science Institute has been able to help us out here. He says, regarding these early release observations, I've also seen many people taking guesses about which target the JWST team will release first. In fact, there are many targets. There are several early release observations programs for each instrument on JWST. What the targets are is a closely held secret to all but the Space Telescope Science Institute and NASA executives. I couldn't tell you what they are, even if I knew. But I believe if you want to wager guesses on what will be released first, you should be making a top five list or something instead of a single guess. So Mike there mentions the numerous instruments that will all be taking early release observations, which provides a perfect segue into the instruments on board the James Webb Space Telescope that will be responsible for seeing further than we've ever seen before and unpicking the secrets of the universe. So first up, there's NearCam, the Near Infrared Camera. So this is the imaging workhorse. This is the camera that's going to be taking the pretty pictures like we used to from Hubble. This is where the James Webb Space Telescope gets the images that they'll want to show off to the public, as well as revealing a lot of revolutionary science data. It's going to bring new insights right across astrophysics and cosmology, from the first-born stars and galaxies to the stars in nearby galaxies, even the really close-by stuff relatively, like Kuiper Belt objects in our solar system. You name it, it's going to have a look at it and take images of it. And NearCam is equipped with coronagraphs. So these are quite literally disks that you use to block out strong light sources coming into the camera's field of view. And they allow you to see something really faint nearby. So for example, you would block out the starlight from a star so that you can see fainter exoplanets orbiting it. Without the coronagraph, the starlight would obliterate the surrounding area, making the faint planet impossible to see. But what's really exciting about this camera, which we haven't had before on a big space telescope like this, is it's going to allow imaging in two wavelengths simultaneously. So previously, you had to swap out filters and take a second image, which of course takes twice as long. So this kind of doubles the amount of science you can do immediately because imaging in two different wavelengths at the same time means you get to do twice as much, which is very, very cool. And NearCam has an astonishing, get this, 29 filters that it can switch between. So that allows you to do everything from very broadband imaging to very narrow band imaging. So you can do both at the same time, capturing all the light available and very specific wavelengths while filtering out everything else for precise observations. Basically, everything you need for whatever object you want to look at and how you want to view it. Which is just as well, because it's too far away to go out to if you've forgotten a filter or two. Then the second instrument is near spec. So this is the near infrared spectrograph. So this is the spectrograph that complements near cam. It'll look at the same sort of wavelength range, but this is the instrument that will spread the light out into a spectrum so that we can see emission lines at very particular wavelengths, allowing us to figure out the actual physical properties of an object like temperature, mass and chemical composition, things like that. But there's something really spectacular on near spec, and this is a new invention for the James Webb Space Telescope because it's equipped with a hundred micro shutters. Now, each of these micro shutters is about the width of a human hair. It's amazing. They have lids that open and close when you apply a magnetic field to them, and every single one can be controlled individually. So you can open and close them. You can use them to block out a portion of the sky, or you can take a hundred 
different spectra at the same time. It's astonishing. It's a very, very sexy piece of technology. It's absolutely brilliant. And what this is going to allow us to do is something called IFU spectroscopy. So integral field unit spectroscopy is where you take lots and lots of spectra over very, very small fields of view. So then you get the 2D spatial dimensions, but you also get these spectral dimensions and it just allows you to figure out exactly what's going on in each of these little points. Think of it like the compound eye of an insect and how it zeroes in on hundreds of tiny portions of its surroundings all at once with incredible detail and pieces them together to create a whole world view. Only in this case, we can go one step further and do it with spectroscopy to reveal hundreds of individual images revealing the compositions in any specific part of the image. It's absolutely phenomenal and groundbreaking technology. And it's got other spectroscopic capabilities as well. That's just one of them with those hundred little micro shutters. Others are optimized for looking at exoplanets as they pass in front of their host star. That will let us figure out the composition of those impossibly far away atmospheres. And that's also brand new and could lead to us finding life on faraway worlds. Now near cam and near spec, they will work ideally at an ultra low temperature of 37 Kelvin. So that's minus 230 degrees or so. And that can be achieved through passive cooling using the sun shield. So this is five layers of reflective material which reflect away radiation from the sun at each layer and keeps the telescope cool because the telescope is an infrared telescope, so incredibly sensitive to any temperatures. If we don't keep it shaded from the sun, all it can see is its own heat source. And those instruments will work as long as they work, basically, like Hubble now. They'll go on until they malfunction as the long prospects for this telescope because they don't rely on any other kind of cooling than the sun shields. But there are other instruments that require active helium cooling to operate at much lower temperatures. And that's why the fuel saving on the launch that we spoke about earlier was so important. Although JWST was a five year mission initially, we think it has now been extended to more than 10 years because of the precise Ariane launch, as that fuel saving can now go into keeping the telescope cooled down for longer. So then another key instrument is MIRI, which is the mid infrared instrument. And this is a camera and a spectrograph that looks at longer infrared wavelengths. And because it's looking at these longer wavelengths, it has to be actively cooled using liquid helium as well. But again, this is imaging, it's spectroscopy. And then there's the fine guidance sensor and the near infrared imaging spectrograph on board. So primarily, this is for pointing, but you know, while it's looking at things, it can do a little bit of science as well. But really this, this camera is all about tracking objects for the other instruments to look at. But for MIRI, 10 years is our maximum. It's not like Hubble where we can just put band-aids on it and keep it going for another 10 years. That's going to be it. It's so far out in space that no one can rescue it with current spacecraft. Now, I know what you're thinking. The Elon fanboys are already drumming up custom for SpaceX by suggesting Starship will be able to get there easily and service JWST, but they're offering up a prototype rocket for a complex mission, a rocket that they don't own themselves. So while I'm sure NASA have this in the back of their mind as a possibility one day, until Starship is operational, there is nothing in the arsenal to perform a rescue mission like we did with Hubble. And while it might seem like it, that's not a bad thing. We don't necessarily want to keep patching up Hubble and JWST indefinitely. We want newer and bigger and better telescopes to replace the aging workhorses. Because remember all those delays for JWST and how it sat around for five years waiting to be launched? Well, that means that JWST technology is already 10 years old. 
I mean, it's wonderful and it's the latest generation space telescope, but the technology was still already 10 years old before it was even launched. So already astronomers are thinking, what can we do with today's technology? What can we launch next? And then that's going to be 10 years behind the curve when that launches too. This is just the nature of space science. Because it sounds so high tech and you look inside a Soyuz capsule, we fire Soyuz capsules routinely and it looks like the 1960s tech that it is because it's old and trusted and reliable and it works. And you look at the space shuttle and it looked like a 70s airliner because the tech was developed a decade before it flew. Even smaller missions like Rosetta to the comet churyumov gerasimenko that spacecraft had launched over 10 years before it landed and that technology design had been frozen years before launch so it was tech from before smartphones were invented by the time it reached its destination. And to stretch the point, New Horizons to Pluto used the processor from a PlayStation 2 because it was tested by millions of people and shown to work on Earth. It's easy to get obsessed by the latest technology but we've got to remember you never put untested technology in space. You put stuff in that you know is going to work. But this is all to say that it's okay for spacecraft and space technologies to have a limited lifespan because we're already planning the next generation and they won't get funded until the existing scopes get old, decrepit or keel over. So onto the science for James Webb. And the big thing that's really known about the James Webb Space Telescope is it's going to have a look at the very first stars and galaxies to form. The very first, that's a really big thing. It's going to be able to see further back than Hubble and that's because it's an infrared space telescope. This early light from the first stars and galaxies would have been emitted in ultraviolet and optical wavelengths but because of cosmological redshift that light has travelled through an expanding universe making it no longer visible in the optical and UV wavelengths. So we would see it today in infrared. So that's the big thing. JWST's tuned, if you like, to image these redshifted stars and galaxies that made up the very first light in the universe. So impossibly far away, almost 14 billion years ago. And if seeing the first stars and galaxies isn't enough for you, then there's a big focus on seeing the entire timeline without any gaps in galaxy formation and evolution. So that is right from the cosmic dawn through to the present day. So cosmic dawn is those first stars. This involves discovering hundreds if not thousands of new galaxies in the very early universe, understanding unusual systems such as starburst galaxies. Those are the ones which have extraordinarily high star formation rates. We also want to better understand the relationship between galaxies and supermassive black holes, the ones that sit in the very center of galaxies and how feedback from those supermassive black holes impacts galaxy evolution. Then another big focus and perhaps the one that most excites me is exoplanet atmospheres. So this is finding out what they're made of, what conditions are like, so temperature, pressure, density, things like that. The telescope will be able to peer through clouds of dust to see newly formed stars and planets. We'll also be able to better understand stellar and planetary evolution, how they form and develop over millions and billions of years from beginning through to their deaths. In our solar system, it's going to be looking at Kuiper Belt objects, including the dwarf planets Pluto and Eris. It's going to study Jupiter's cloud layers, its winds, their compositions, auroral activity on Jupiter. It's going to map Jupiter's moons, Io and Ganymede, look at Jupiter's ring system. At Mars, It'll help us understand the trace organics that we find in Mars's atmosphere, hopefully helping us to figure out where they come from, how they're replenished when they break down in sunlight. Because we want to know if gases like methane on Mars 
come from geological processes, which it shouldn't, because Mars is geologically dead, or from organic processes, that is, life on Mars. So the thing that really hits you about James Webb is that it's almost an omni-telescope. It's pretty much covering everything from local astronomy through to cosmology. It does a bit of everything. Well, actually, no, it does a lot of everything. It's a catch-all telescope and a time machine. And this is why it's so expensive and why it's taken so long. Because if it was a dedicated space telescope that was going to look at one specific thing, then it would have been a lot quicker to develop. But it has to have this multifunctional capability. So that's why it's taken so long to design and build and test, and why the cost is comparatively high, but worth it despite all the overruns. If it does a fraction of all that, it'll be totally worth it. And NASA told us last week that we can expect the first tantalizing images in just a few days, and then a decade or more of incredible discoveries we've never had the equipment to search for in all of human history until now. And if you're hungry for more about the James Webb Space Telescope, check out these videos here.